So um, our next speaker is um, Terry Thorson. He is the co-founder and CTO of ChartIQ, who also happened to have a booth over there. And um, today he will be giving us a talk about Electron in the Enterprise. So give it up for Terry. Thank you. Just log in. I'm going to save everyone from having to watch another PowerPoint. Uh, actually, the PowerPoints today have been really impressive. Uh, but I'm going to switch to live demo, and I'm going to sacrifice a dead chicken to the demo gods before I do that. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Terry, and I'm going to talk about uh, building Electron apps in the enterprise. Um, my company uh, has been doing this for a while. And in fact, we offer a software development kit specifically uh, aimed at developers in the enterprise who want to build complex applications that is based off of Electron. Um, we didn't always do this. Uh, it's something we discovered. And so I'm going to tell you the tale of how we got here uh, and how along the way we learned three big things. Uh, these three big things that we learned changed the way that we are thinking about the desktop. Uh, and they have implications even for how we might think about the web. So before I get started, let me set the scene. What do I mean by enterprise software? Um, so I would define enterprise software as the type of software that large companies, you know, usually predominantly large companies, build, sometimes buy, in order to meet their business operations needs, to support that. Um, <clears throat> and we sometimes think about you know, databases like Oracle. We might think about AWS or Azure. Uh, that's all enterprise software. But this is a desktop conference. So we're talking about the types of software that people use. right? They're using their eyes to look at it. They're using their hands to interact with it, uh, using tools, the same thing that we've been doing as humans for a million years and we will do at least for another couple decades. Um, <laughs> and uh, enterprises are largely building and buying the software for their employees. The employees are kind of the backbone uh, of our economy, so it's a really important set of users. Uh, and the thing about the enterprise is that they have this problem. They have too many apps. Right? Now, we all have too many apps. We've got browser tabs going off to infinity. We've got a million apps that we've downloaded on our, on our phone. Someone's downloading an app right now. Um, but the interesting thing about the enterprise is they, they've always had this problem. The enterprise was the, really the, the first part of our economy to uh, start using software for efficiency. Um, and they have lots of employees, uh, and they have lots of products and lots of things they need to do, which is why they build so much software. So if you take a quick history of enterprise software, right, for those of us old enough to remember, those of us that have looked in the history books, it all started with the mainframe, right? As soon as uh, software was, was built, the enterprise said, holy cow, that this is going to change everything, right? And they started hiring legions and legions of COBOL programmers. And they built screen after screen after screen after screen, right? And uh, you might still see this, like if you go to uh, the gate at uh, an airline and want to make a change to the reservation. One moment. Where would you like to go? It's still moving, right? What are they doing? They're navigating through mainframe screens, their saver system, uh, typing key codes, tabbing through. Uh, fields, uh, navigating it, they've all got it in their head. Uh, and this was basically state of the art and uh, really worked really well for decades. Um, <clears throat> during the 80s and 90s, there was a brief dalliance with client server applications that didn't really work out. Things only started changing uh, in the early 2000s when corporate discovered the web, right? Ooh, this is a lot easier than writing COBOL code. And so they hired all these JSP programmers and ASP programmers to start building web page after web page after web page after web page. And they wrapped them all in what was called a portal, right? So the portal was this thing that you had to navigate to to get your job done, right? You'd go through a menu, into a VPN, into another menu, into another VPN, off to an iframe to do two-factor authentication, and then back. And then eventually, you got to your business app, which by that time had this much of the screen left. Um, but that's all ancient history now, right? So today, we're writing using modern frameworks, and we're building components, right? And so right now, across enterprises all over the globe, there are legions of JavaScript programmers writing component after component after component after component. 
Um, and they're kind of doing the same thing, and it's a little more elegant, but it's also a little slower. So we have to think about why the enterprise needs so many apps. Right? And it's simply because the enterprise does a lot of stuff. That's the very paradigm of the enterprise. Mass begets mass. You take your distribution, your existing products, and you sell more, and you do more, and you grow. Uh, enterprises have many types of users. So think about your uh, big box building supply store. Right? You know the cashier. There's also the person at the returns desk. There's the manager. There's the person in the back you know, ordering stuff from the warehouse. There's the person back at the home office. They have Enterprises have all sorts of products, right? Again, we think about the stuff on the aisles that we're buying, um, <clears throat> but you know they're offering a credit card. They have loyalty points. Uh, they've got the carpet in the back that they have to get shipped directly from the man manufacturer. And they have all different sorts of customers. They've got us wandering the aisles, but they've also got contractors going up to the contractor aisle and buying on credit. Um, <clears throat> and every one of these uh, situations demands a different app. Right? And there's a different team. There's one in Pune, there's one in Shanghai, there's one in Boulder, one in Denver, and those guys don't talk, all writing these different applications. Add to the mix the fact there's acquisitions, right? They're like buying companies, and those come with their own load of software, and there's third-party tools, vendors like ours, uh, saying, hey, we can solve the problem for you, just buy the software for a couple million bucks, and that needs to be integrated. And then on top of that, like the very reason for the enterprise, cross-selling. We've got credit card, we've got our loyalty points program. Hey man, let's give some loyalty points whenever someone charges some money. Uh oh, right? Because now you've got the Pune developers and the Shanghai developers with their separate apps. These guys wrote it in Angular, and these guys wrote it in React, and now you need to do an integration uh, job. <clears throat> and that is largely what happens in the enterprise all day long, all year long, all decade long, integrations, right? The infamous integrations. Um, which brings us to Electron. So we, <clears throat> we're you know, working with a lot of uh, enterprise companies, uh, particularly in finance, and we started seeing Electron apps popping up. And we, we wonder about, well, what's the allure of the Electron app? Uh, and it kind of cuts through everything that I've been talking here. Um, it's got an icon, right? I mean, this is a basic thing. But when you think about you know, navigating through those mainframe screens, those portals, there's something really beautiful and elegant about an icon that I can click to get my most important thing popping up on the screen. Uh, they're desktop apps, right? So all the browser Chrome's gone, and what we have is a desktop app that's more beautiful than any desktop app that's ever been built, right? And it just, you know, without that browser Chrome, it just shines on the screen. Uh, and they're super quick to build, right? Uh, slap a web page in, you know, uh, compile it, squirrelize it. Uh, you've got an Electron app. That's part of what has made Electron so successful, is that instant gratification we get as developers using it. Uh, and they're super easy to deploy, right? Um, you know, everyone except for Luca can uh, web deploy their assets uh, and, you know, immediately get that. Every time they start the app up, they're getting the latest stuff and you don't have to ship new software over. And so what we started seeing in these companies that we're dealing with was that they're building Electron apps. App after app after app after app. All right, so you can see where this pattern is going. Uh, and that's where our story starts. We, we accidentally stumbled into this about four years ago uh, when we were uh, talking to a customer of ours that had built a, a trading terminal. Right? Uh, it was built in C++. It was a really good trading terminal, but it was about 12, 15 years old. Uh, and it's just really hard to hire C++ engineers now. And so they started hiring you know, these JavaScript engineers, and they wanted to build a modern frameworks at that time. It was probably Angular. Um, and they started dabbling with, well, how do, how do we do this? How do we do desktop apps you know, if we're going to abandon our C++? And so they started fiddling around with Electron. And they said, OK, what's the, the first thing that we need to do? Let's just prototype this, do it lean, build it fast, see what we can do. Uh, and so they built a portfolio page. And it looks, looked a little like this, right? Portfolio page is the center of any trading application. It's just a list of the stocks you own, the securities you own, how much you've got. Um, and of course, they built it really fast, Angular, they built a little REST API, they wrapped it up in Electron, double clicked the icon, brought it into the business side, and they were like, whoa, you guys built this in two days. That's amazing. Let's, let's try something else. Right? So at the time, we were the preeminent vendor of high performance JavaScript time series engines for finance. We are still the preeminent JavaScript vendor for time series uh, finance charts in uh, finance. Um, 
but we do much more than that. But at that time, that's how we got called in. They said, hey, let's see how this electron thing behaves with something that's a little more intensive, right? And we all know now, like whatever chromium can do, electron could probably do. But at the time, no one really knew. And so they called us in as a vendor, and we looked at their portfolio page that they did, and we said, well, we'll wrap a chart in that. And it looked a little bit like this. Fancy JavaScript chart. You can move it around and all that. Um, <clears throat> high fives. Hey, thank you, vendor. This is great. Uh, showing the business people. And then uh, business guy you know, asked that most naive of all questions. He said, oh, can you make it so that when you double click on one of those uh, stock symbols in the portfolio, the chart changes? And that's when we discovered big thing number one. A web page is a component. Right? So what you have here on the screen are two components. They are on the screen at the same time. They take up space. They are expected to communicate with each other, to work with each other. And therefore, there's an implication that they need to be orchestrated. And this is very natural for any component that we've built, whether it's an Angular component, React component, J2E, EJV. Um, but it's not natural for a web page. So we have to ask ourselves, well, why not? And I think it goes back to the very history and purpose of the browser. The, the browser was designed for content, not for applications. Right? Um, it's a single empty rectangle that scrolls infinitely vertically. Right? So if you've ever struggled with uh, trying to get uh, your web page to maximize to the height of a screen and had to resort to JavaScript hacks or CSS hacks, it's because it wasn't designed to do that. Right? That HTML doesn't accommodate that concept. Um, the browser was built for navigation, right? That's why we have all this browser Chrome. It's, it's Tim Berners-Lee, it's hypertext. You were meant to go to a web page, click on something, and go to another web page that has no idea who that other web page is. They weren't supposed to know about each other, and they weren't supposed to talk to each other. And of course, if you're coding in JavaScript in the browser, there's no API above window. Like, window is the dome across our universe, and beyond that is the infinite unknown, as far as any JavaScript uh, application. It lives in its solipsistic fantasy that it has everything in its beautiful single-threaded world. Um, but the thing about Electron in this scenario here is it, it breaks this hegemony that the browser has always had on displaying uh, HTML5 in a single rectangle. It breaks these windows out of their solipsistic worlds. Um, as a web, a web page, as a component, uh, is side by side. It's not living in a separate browser tab. Why would you ever have two browser tabs talk to each other, right? You can't see them at the same time. It makes no sense. But when they're side by side, suddenly it makes sense. And they can be organized, right? Once you have these things on the screen, you might want to organize them into workspaces. Um, and the thing that's beautiful about it is it's inherently loosely coupled, right? Each one of these, as its own independent browser process, runs in its own JavaScript VM. It can be built in isolation. But using IPC, you can expose an interface so they can communicate with each other. So back to the story. We now had these two Electron apps side by side, and we're starting to think about uh, how to integrate them. Uh, but there's a problem, right? They're independent Electron apps. We had to launch them from two different icons. And that didn't, didn't make any sense at all. Um, you needed something to launch them all. You needed an Uber process, like a meta component. And of course, the customer now wanted to launch a bunch of these things and organize them in workspaces, like I mentioned. Uh, we needed a, a toolbar, right? That's the sort of the paradigm that we've always used. And so we went about inventing a toolbar. There's a toolbar, right? Using my trackpad on my Windows 7 Mac boot camp. Um, and this is when we discovered big thing number two a window is a div, right? Once you take the browser Chrome away from a window, you get a canvas. You get an empty rectangle. Um, on the loose, it can take any shape or size. We've got a long, thin web page here. You would never build a web page that is 40 pixels high and 10, 1080 pixels wide. Um, but you can. Um, and absent the overhead, because we've got pro, you know, process per site, we've got affinity, uh, the windows can uh, proliferate. And so, for instance, here I've got ephemeral windows, windows that uh, are coming and going uh, to simulate menus. And again, it's a beautiful thing to be able to build a menu in complete, loosely coupled isolation like this. 
So this all leads to really this idea of a new form factor for HTML. So back to the story. Uh, we now have a single app that's composed of multiple independent windows. Right? They can move across monitors. Uh, there are toolbars on the desktop. It's creating this really immersive experience. And of course, everything is web deployed, right? Every, the content of every one of these is coming from you know, an intranet site or a vendor. Uh, instantly, you're getting it every time you bring up that component. And of course, you know, the, the customer at this point wants to throw everything into it, into the kitchen sink. But, but really, at best, right now, we have a parlor trick, right? We've got this enterprise mashup of things appearing at the same, same time. Um, and we start thinking about, well, what does it mean if we get all the things, these, these components working together? And when we really thought about that, we stumbled across big thing number three, which is that the desktop is a network, right? So I've hidden them, but let me show you all my icons. I'm going to show you my inner mind here, right? All of these little desktop applications all living in isolation, none of them talking to one another. But here in Electron, these windows, we can now get to talk to one another. So if I put these on the same channel and then uh, do the double click of MMM, this one changes. Um, they haven't been built that way. They were not built into a single React page you know, with a single store. Um, they're just sharing data over, over interfaces, like all good components should. Um, the really amazing thing about this, so IPC provides us this really nice way to interact around cross-origin that is safe, you know, as long as it's defined interfaces and you're, you're orchestrating properly. Uh, but it also allows these applications to communicate without going out to the cloud, right? The desktop is a network. You're doing that communication right on the desktop. It's fast and it's cheap. So suddenly we're finding that with very little effort, we're creating workflows that ordinarily in the enterprise would have been month-long projects. So let's think about well, like, why is integration so expensive? And think about the task of integrating, say, two browser tabs. Right? Let's just take, I don't know, let's see if Salesforce comes up here. Imagine you had Salesforce and this portfolio tab here, and you were told to integrate them. Right? So the first thing you're going to think about is your data layer. You're going to say, OK, well, hopefully they have REST interfaces. If not, we've got to build them. And then maybe I'll build a single REST interface, or maybe I'll build a GraphQL model, right, and build my GraphQL infrastructure. Once you have that in place, you can start thinking about UI. OK, well, I, I can't use Salesforce to use my grid. I could maybe make a lightning component. That wouldn't make much sense. I can't put Salesforce into my grid. I can't, you know, what am I going to do? You end up rewriting the entire UI. And of course, because that's impossible, you write a very lowest common denominator. And then you've got single sign-on, right? Now you've got a single sign-in. Your, your single uh, page application needs to sign into both of these systems. You've got infrastructure. You've got the cloud to, to deal with. Um, it's because that's, that's a tightly coupled way of building uh, software and doing integration. And so it's slow, and it's molasses slow in a large enterprise. Uh, but with Electron, we have an alternative, right? So each one of these individual apps, they already have their own UI. It's already been built, custom made. Perfect UI for Salesforce is Salesforce. Perfect UI for a portfolio page is a portfolio page. They're already accessing the data. They've already figured that out. They already have authentication. You log into Salesforce, you log into this data grid. Why would you break all of that just to get them to talk to one another? So instead, we have this alternative. Uh, expose interfaces through IPC. What's an interface? It's just a message, right? And you can expose a message. Sales, the Salesforce app can expose a message that says, switch to a different contact, right? And it can expose a message that says, give me the data for that contact. Um, and it can also publish proactively uh, what contact it's looking at. And an orchestration layer can help other components decide which components can talk to each other. Um, and uh, move that around. Uh, I like to call this restless int integration. Uh, it's pure JavaScript. It's super fast. It's on the desktop. It's loosely coupled, and it's that 80-20 rule. You're getting 80, 90, 95% of the value of your integration for like 1% of the effort. No, it's not a completely homogenous, perfect UI like you would if you built that sort of fantasy SBA. Um, but for a business user, you're getting 
instant workflow and uh, instant capability. So here we are uh, four years later. Uh, the interesting thing is this, this model in our little neck of the woods in capital markets is a bona fide model. Um, it's even got its own categories called desktop interop. Uh, and large banks, asset managers, fancy word for mutual funds and hedge funds, uh, are all very busy building these systems and doing these integrations. Um, <clears throat> our product, Finsemble, is uh, an orchestration layer that allows them to do this. Um, and ultimately, it's really good news for enterprise users, right? Um, these are people who have been desktop bound. They're tethered to their desktop. Uh, they're using their hands, their eyes, just like we talked about. And they've been languishing for decades with really terrible software. Um, <clears throat> developers not having to do these integrations, not having to build all this architecture and using this loosely coupled system, we're seeing it. They are switching from building architecture and all this overhead to actually focusing on the applications, the business applications, getting more cycles on the actual uh, stuff that the users want. Uh, and because it's Electron, it's HTML5, right? So that beautiful, elegant experience that we see in Slack, we see in Spotify, Visual Studio Code, the thing that you know, turned our heads and made us want to work in Electron, the enterprise developers are able to do that kind of work very quickly using modern frameworks and bring that out to their users. So ultimately, it spells uh, a really brand new world for enterprise users. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Going once, twice, oh, yep. Uh, are there any interesting challenges in deploying to enterprise around things like um, like they're running weird software or proxies or things that make that, like working with Electron challenging or um, or like uh, security compliance or anything, anything like that? Like, what, what's your experience been like with that? It's, it's very challenging. So antivirus software, right? Uh, antivirus does not like Electron executables. Um, we, we know that almost instantly. As soon as they say, oh, the, you're, the app is taking 40 seconds to launch antivirus. Um, proxies, absolutely. Um, local host, uh, in a lot of companies, uh, local host is verboten. Um, so uh, debugging, you have to go Chrome inspect. Um, there are all sorts of uh, deployment issues. Um, you know, enterprises are generally using group policy, so you really have to, to learn that and understand that. Uh, and there's you know, often confusion about deploying uh, an executable. So when we, we package this up, we package up a very thin runtime, which is basically an Electron app uh, with some orchestration around it. And everything else is web deployed, so all the libraries come in. Um, <clears throat> but getting IT to uh, deploy those and update those regularly uh, is definitely a challenge. They're not going to use Squirrel, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that's part of you know, the, the, the game of being an enterprise software vendor. And there, there are plenty of challenges. There's different ones every single day. You'd think that if you're on one Windows 10 box, that it would behave exactly the same as another Windows 10 box, and is not the case. Uh, it is you know, amazing the variability in environment. Um, one in the back here. What's the advantage of having like multiple apps over multiple windows? If it's communicating to a server, you could have had multiple windows and orchestrate that communication directly via Electron's own IPC. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this is effectively using Electron IPC under the covers. We provide a layer that allows you to declaratively say which uh, components are allowed to talk to each other. OK, so essentially it's one app with multiple windows. And it's not one anything. app with multiple windows. The, the, you know, the, the thing to note is that these windows, you know, from the component developer's perspective, they're just building a web page. There's an API that they need to subscribe to information and publish information. Uh, but they don't have to build with the entire Electron API. And they don't have to have to communicate with each other. So when you have these disparate teams, uh, they can all work in isolation on their component as long as they agree to this interface. And then generally, the architects back you know, in the home office are working on the Electron layer uh, and some of the deeper integration work. That's very clever. Yeah. Uh, hey, over here. Um, wait. Over here. Yep. 
Uh, so how do you send uh, updates to your enterprise clients? So, I mean, our typical enterprise client uses group policy. So their developers will compile the latest version of the runtime, uh, and then they will use group policy to push it out to their end users. Um, I mean, the primary motivator is the Electron updates. The, the enterprise is absolutely paranoid about um, security. The, the, the best thing for our little category and for us as a vendor was when Electron became current with Chromium. Uh, it was, we were constantly plagued by that, uh, that risk factor. And, you know, we felt like Luca, like, you know, your risk, you know, is pretty minimal if you're within a couple of weeks. Um, but um, that's, that's a big concern to them. So, you know, they get into this cadence of, you know, we deliver uh, a new API, they compile the runtime, they push it out to uh, their end users through group policy. Um, building off of your first question, uh, where you said that each client deployment has a lot of variability in terms of their security settings and whatnot. Do you have any strategies for like preempting that or is it just kind of debug as things go wrong? So uh, we, we spend a considerable amount of time with instrumentation. So for instance, this is what we call our central logger. Um, and it effectively, all these components can use the logging interface to log information uh, and it goes to a single logging instance. Uh, and it uh, synchronizes all of those events. So oftentimes you get events crossing windows. Uh, it turns out there was, I don't know if there still is, there's a, a, a bug in Chromium where different windows can actually start on different milliseconds, so you can't rely on that across windows. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a tool that our developers will use. Uh, and there's also an instrumentation log. So if, a, if, a, if an end user experiences a problem in the field, uh, a support person can go over there basically turn on instrumentation, go through ex the experience, you know, produce that log, ship it off to us, and we can replay it. Uh, but the thing is, in the enterprise, and particularly in finance, you're, you're supporting people that you cannot talk to, you cannot go and see them, you cannot WebEx into their desktop terminal, you may not even be allowed to know what they're doing and what apps they have. Uh, so it is kind of like, you know, debugging an you know, Apollo spacecraft from, you know, uh, telemetrics that, that come through. So those replay systems are, are really, really important. Hi. Um, you showed Salesforce there. How do you, that's presumably totally external code. Yes. How do you interact with, if say it's on the same channel as something you have open, do you inject stuff via preload script and uh, capture some of the inputs? So yes and no. So Salesforce, you can preload and sort of hack websites. Uh, we tried that earlier on, we learned our lesson. It's fragile, it's brittle. Um, so for third-party code, uh, you really need the cooperation of the vendor. In the case of Salesforce, they have the Lightning API, which allows us to run client code uh, in there. So what we'll do with the Salesforce implementation uh, is we'll give uh, a piece of Salesforce code uh, that they'll, you know, um, the customer will implement in their Salesforce, and then we'll give them a preload that interacts with that. Right, so we're using real Salesforce APIs behind the scenes to do all the communication, uh, and then using a preload to wire that to IPC. Hey. Yes, uh, sir. Oh. Um, I have a question about the concept of, say, transactions happening between the, like two different providers, something that, that either needs to complete or not complete. Um, say you're spending points for one thing and it needs to compensate another one. How does that system, is, is there like a primitive for that sort of transaction in systems that don't necessarily have that concept? You, you got what I mean? Like the, the integration is happening at the client side. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a way for it to coordinate two things that need to happen, what, what if one of them fails network, stuff like that? Is, that? is that something that typically needs to be handled? Like workflows. Um, so you're talking about like basically a transaction commit, you know, ethnicity across. Yeah, I mean, no, there's really no good way to do with this. It's, it's best for, you know, lightweight uh, workflows that you're building on the desktop. You know, one of the ways I like to think of this is you think about like a MuleSoft or whatnot that's doing uh, back-end workflows. Uh, this can be the final stage of that, where you're actually doing the, the integrations with the individual apps. And what we find in enterprises, a lot of times, like a single workflow will actually prompt up 
multiple components because the, uh, the, the employee will have um, like a situation that they need to deal with that will show them information and have a couple things to act on. Um, but you know, generally when you're on the client, um, you know, it's, you know, your client communication is reliable. Uh, I think, you know, if they get to the point where that client communication then translates into a back-end transaction, you know, caveat emptor, it's just not a good design. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. Hello. Hey. You may or may not be able to answer this, but I am curious, uh, since your app has to run in the enterprise, uh, how often do you um, have security audits and how well do those go and what have you discovered that you can disclose that it would be interesting <laughs> for us running in the enterprise? So we, we have had security audits. Uh, and uh, you know, first thing to note is most uh, pen test firms are not familiar with Electron. Um, so uh, again, Luca, you know, a guy like that who really knows Electron back back and forth can be extremely valuable. Um, we uh, we've been doing them semi semi annually, um, and you know, because people don't know Electron, it's a little bit guided, so they're using basic security uh, principles. Um, I think context isolation was one of them that uh, you know we looked at uh, and be, be, became apparent. Uh, although that again, I'd say we get more benefit out of the guidance that the Electron community itself is putting out than any Pentrest. I mean, they're just testing to make sure that our, our code is done correctly and there's no obvious vulnerabilities. Follow up. Uh, yeah. You said that enterprises want an updated version of Chromium. That's a big request. Is there a second request that they that they look for or are asking for? Uh, in a, around security or from Electron in general? Around security. Um, no, I can't think of I can't think of one. I mean, I think you know the understanding of Electron is very base uh, among the business side, but even among the tech side. Uh, we, we have to do a lot of education even explaining what the concept is. Um, so I think you know that the world has relied on the browser constantly updating and we feel safe because of it. Um, and so that's kind of our message actually is because this is based on Chromium, you know, we're gonna lean on the browser. We're gonna cut node integration, context isolation, uh, sandbox it, let's let it behave as much like the browser as we can because we know that that's trusted and that's a message that works. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, just, I guess, one, one time for just one last question. Sorry about that. Cool. I guess it's me. Um, booting up a browser window is generally a lot slower than opening a new tab. Do you do anything clever in terms of reusing the browser window instances or having a bunch of empty ones that you start up when the application starts? Anything like that? We don't. In fact, we, we toyed around with that very early on. Um, and. Uh, what we found was the, the Electron performance was uh, getting faster and faster, uh, and we didn't need it. We didn't need to jump through those hoops. Um, ultimately, the, like the, from a user experience, it's, the, it's actually the content loading that's the slowest part. Um, so the biggest change for us was moving to browser view, uh, where we could have our, our Chrome, like our toolbars and title bars, uh, appearing very quickly because they were local. Uh, and then the content, which is basically, you know, if content that's slow, you get that white screen that looks really horrible to an end user. Um, but that would be constrained to the, uh, the browser view. So I would say Electron, you know, just getting faster and faster is, is key. And then browser view was like a huge, uh, huge move forward for us. All right. Well, thank you very much, Terry. Thank you. Uh, I did see a few more hands up. So maybe go, <laughs> go visit the chart IQ booth if you have any more questions.